Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to GYSS 2022. It's my great honor to invite Professor Stephen Hill to give a seminar entitled Mean Flux and it means that provide a molecular scale resolution in fluorescence microscope. Allow me to introduce Professor Stephen Hill. Professor Stephen Hill is a director at both the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen and the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg, Germany. Professor Hale is accredited with having conceived, validated, and applied the forcible wipe concept for overcoming Abbey's diffraction limited resolution barrier in a light focusing fluorescence microscope. For this accomplishment, he has received many awards, including the 2014 Cavalier Prize in Nanoscience and the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Professor Stephen Hale received his doctorate degree in physics from the University of Heidelberg in 1990. From 1991 to 1993, he worked at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, followed by stays as a senior researcher at the University of Turku, Finland, between 1993 and 1996. And as a visiting scientist at the University of Oxford, England, in 1994. In 1997, he was appointed to the MPI for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen as a group leader, and was promoted to director in 2002. From 2003 and 2017, he, was, he also led a research group at the German Cancer Research Center. Professor Ho, Hell holds honorary professorships in physics at the University of Heidelberg and Göttingen. And his research has inspired many people, including myself. So without further delay, let's welcome Professor Stephen Hell, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Liu. Uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here and, um, and speak about uh, the latest development in what is called fluorescence nanoscopy or super resolution fluorescence microscopy. I'm sure you know that throughout the 20th century, it was widely accepted that the resolution of any fluorescent microscope is fundamentally limited by diffraction uh, to about um, 200 nanometers. And the best, um, uh, uh, say, contrast modality uh, or, or resolution for that matter was achieved by the so called uh, confocal microscope. But um, things changed uh, at the turn of the century, of the 21st century, when stat microscopy was uh, uh, in invented and developed, because stat microscopy showed that it's impossible to come up with a, a, a physical, say, um, method that fundamentally improves the spatial resolution, gets a higher um, uh, spatial um, resolution uh, up to roughly a factor of 10. So from 200 nanometers down to about um, 20 nanometers. And just as you've heard from Dr. Liu, this has led um, to a Nobel Prize. Um, uh, and what I'm showing here is actually the official uh, poster of the Nobel Foundation. At the time, the Nobel Prize was awarded in, in 2014. And it shows um, the concepts uh, that share the prize, namely STET microscopy, which here is sketched um, having a, a beam that turns molecules on. The green beam turns fluorescent molecules on so that they emit fluorescent light. Then there is another beam that turns fluorescent molecules off. It's shown here as a, as a red donut shaped beam to confine those on state molecules to the center of that beam. And then of course, by scanning uh, with those beams across the specimen, you separate the molecules by sequentially turning them on and off if they are um, too close, if su such that they are um, uh, separable. Now, um, uh, I had an honor of sharing the prize with uh, Eric Wetzig and, and W. E. Myrna. And Eric Wetzig demonstrated for the first time that you can up with a, with a variant of, um, of this on and off modality, where not, say, say, groups of molecules are turned on and off in a certain regions, like uh, defined by a donut, but molecules are turned on and off individually. So the mechanism for separating molecules is the same in palm storm and instead, but the way it's done, um, is uh, somewhat different. Now, what it's also similar in both of these concepts is that both have the capability of attaining a spatial resolution that is truly at the molecular scale. So in, in theory, so each of the, the two methods, both um, STED and PALM or STORM, can attain a spatial resolution that is able to separate molecules even if they are as close as the size of the molecules themselves, so a nanometer, two or three or four. Now, that's just in principle, but in practice, 
at the time the Nobel Prize was given, if I may say so, the resolution um, wasn't better than 20 nanometers. So it was not possible to get um, higher resolution improvement factor than a factor of 10. And so the Nobel Foundation actually put it quite correctly here in this, in this um, um, poster. Uh, the microscopes crossed the threshold, which was a diffraction barrier. Uh, and what I'm adding here is that, but they did not attain the ultimate limit. And therefore, um, the major recent goal in my lab um, in the last, uh, say, few years was to, to get to this ultimate limit. So the goal was attaining a molecular size 3D resolution of, say, a, a one, two, three nanometers that is at the size of um, the molecules itself. And this was, of course, a big step because it meant that we had to improve the resolution by another factor of 10. Because as I said, at the time the Nobel Prize was given, the resolution was only uh, at about 20 nanometers. And only in very rare exceptions, you, get a, you could get a spatial resolution that was better. Now, I explain the situation. Now, let's assume we have an array of molecules which looks like this. And each of these little stars are molecules. They are 11 nanometers apart. So the reason why um, one could not tell them apart um, at subdiffraction distance in, in general was the fact that it was not possible to address them individually and also find out their position individually. So neither Stead nor Palm could do that. And um, if you have this problem, of course, they all light up at the same time and the, the signal is, is confused and confounded. So the key to separating them, and this is, this is really the essence of the whole field, of the whole super resolution field, is that you manage um, to turn them on and off. So th this is the way the molecules are separated. That applies both to, to STAT and palm storm. You need a mechanism for making them emit sequentially, so to speak. Um, and if here, for example, it is shown sequentially on a single molecule basis, as it is usually done in palm storm. And there are several mechanisms of turning molecules on and off. You could do um, uh, de excitation by stimulated emission. You could do a cis trans photoisomerization, electron transfer, and so on. But just remember, in order to separate them, to distinguish them, on and off is the key mechanism that has uh, enabled the development of the field and that has been used so far. And so far, no other, say, effective man mechanism has been identified that can separate molecules. Um, so effectively as an on-off transition. And of course, if you turn them on and off separately, uh, then you can distinguish them. But it doesn't mean that you know where they are. And if you go back, for example, to the palm principle, um, say um, uh, the palm concept could not resolve molecules that are, say, 11 nanometers apart, simply because, um, and this is shown here in a, in a, in a recording, uh, because, um, because um, although the molecules were turned on and off individually, the position um, uh, that, that, uh, that needed to be defined after the molecules were turned on and off could not be defined better than with a, a sigma with an uncertainty, so with standard deviation of say about 15 or 20 nanometers. And this is why one could not know where the molecules really are and therefore if the signal from a single molecule uh, was detected, you, you could not tell if it's this one or that one or that one, because they all fall within this uncertainty. And that's the reason why this image of this say, array of molecules was blurred. And so one way of, um, of addressing this problem and getting to a higher spatial resolution is to, to revisit the way the localization of individual molecules was actually done. And, that's, and now I'm explaining you how people saw that molecules had to be localized in the past. Now, usually people localized molecules in the following way. They had an epifluorescence microscope where the, where the whole field of view was illuminated in, um, in, with excitation light. So this is the green light. And the molecule, for example, is this um, little star. And then this little star fluoresces. It produces fluorescent light, light which is um, direct, directed here to the camera. And then, of course, uh, the camera has pixels and it produces this diffraction blob on a computer screen, um, that is, uh, this diffraction block is due to the fact that the fluorescence light is here diffracted on a camera. And then localization meant actually to find out where the molecule is located, of course, um, in, in the sample plane. And this is done by calculating or finding out the centroid of this emission pattern of this fluorescence pattern, because the center of this fluorescence pattern, of course, must um, 
correlate very strongly by geometrical optics with the position of the molecule on um, uh, in the sample. And of course, um, if you if you calculate that centroid, you will have a certain uncertainty still, and that uncertainty will depend on the number of fluorescence photons because the more fluorescence photons there are on the camera, the more precise will be the, the calculation or the finding out of the position of the molecules um, in the in the in the focal plane. So it scales as you see inversely with the square root of the number of detected fluorescent photons. Now, um, this is what people thought has to be the way molecules are localized. And they didn't think really about another, other ways, effective ways of localizing molecules. And the reason uh, why I was motivated looking into this problem was that it, this is um, actually um, a principle that really is photon greedy. So it needs to maximize the number of fluorescent detection. But maximizing the number of fluorescent detection, the number of fluorescent photons is a problem because usually um, uh, fluorescent molecule bleach, so there is only a limited number of uh, detections and that you can get, you have to wait for, for N to get large and that takes time, so it's slow. And then there is another problem that you will appreciate if you have a physics or physical chemistry background. The, uh, the emission of a molecule is a dipole emission, so to speak. And, and then of course, um, um, the pattern here that you find on a camera will shift in the focal plane if the, the orientation of the molecule changes. So the dipole orientation uh, is a serious problem that, that leads to, um, say, say mislocalizations or shifts, um, systematic shifts that, um, that give us, in the end, a wrong position of the molecule. And since this concept, of course, has serious limitations, it was worth, worthwhile considering a new way of localizing individual molecules, a new way of finding out where um, uh, the molecule is positioned. Now, the rationale is very simple. Um, of course, you need many photons in order to localize um, uh, a molecule because a single photon could never be used to localize the molecule simply because a single photon is diffracted somehow, is, is shifted somewhere somewhere within the diffraction zone, it goes somewhere in the diffraction zone. So you need a pattern of photons, many photons to find where they are. But using a fluorescent pattern is of course not very clever in a way because as I said, the number of fluorescent photons is limited. So why not using a pattern of photons that is from the laser that is coming from the laser because there's, there's plenty of laser photons um, available. So laser is, is very bright. There's no problem uh, getting enough photons. And this is actually the rationale behind the concept that I'm talking about now is called min flux. And it's, um, it uses, for example, um, a donut for identifying the position of the molecule. And this is, of course, is, um, if you will, lend from the concept of stat microscopy, because in stat microscopy, um, the donut defines the position of emission, as I explained to you in the beginning. And so, uh, so this idea of, of defining the position um, of emission, of targeting a certain coordinate in the sample space is taken actually from stat. Now, um, so what do I mean? Um, so if we use a donut beam for excitation, and we have a, if you have a donut pattern, then of course we can very effectively target a certain coordinate in the sample space at will. Because um, the zero here of the uh, intensity of the donut precisely defines the position in the focal plane. And not only that, we can shift um, this position of the donut around with a beam deflector with very high precision, because that's no problem shifting a beam around with the angstrom position in the focal plane. And of course, we can define this position of the zero also, if you will, this angstrom position, because we have plenty of photons coming from, coming from the laser. And then once we have defined the position in the sample space, the only thing we have to do is we have to relate the position or the unknown position of the molecule with the known position of the donor. And of course, if, um, um, uh, if, if we find out the distance between the two, we know where the molecule is because we know the position of the donut. That's perfectly controlled by the, by the electronics of this beam deflector. And so how, how do we know um, how far the two are apart, the zero of the donut and the molecule? It's very simple. If the two coincide in space, then there is no fluorescence emission because here there is a zero beam, um, a zero intensity of the excitation beam. And so there is no there's no fluorescence emission. If it's slightly away, 
if the donut is slightly away from the molecule, there will be some emission. And it's very clear that the brightness of fluorescence that we would detect here at the detector will depend on the on the distance of the molecule from the donut or or the donut zero from the molecule <clears throat> for that matter. And so we don't use a camera here anymore. We just use a confocalized detector. And then uh, we try to figure out where the molecule is just by measuring ac actually uh, the distance between the donut zero and the molecule. And now I'm explaining to you <clears throat> why this concept is so photon effective. In order to make this clear to you, I have introduced a little demon, okay? And demons are, they, they do not exist in reality, but in, at least in thought experiments, you can come up with a demon that knows something that we humans don't know. And in this particular case, imagine that the molecule starts moving and the demon kind of guesses where the molecule goes. What can the demon do in this case? It can shift using this beam deflector, it can shift the donut around in such a way that the excitation intensity zero always coincides with the fluorescent molecule. But the molecule in this case will not fluoresce. Why will it not fluoresce? Simply because it is coinciding with the excitation zero. Yet the demon would perfectly know the position of the molecule because um, it controls the position of the donut and the position of the donut must coincide with the position of the molecule. So the thought experiment tells us that in, in the limiting case of, the, of, a, of a, the existence of a demon in this case, one could say precisely localize the position of the molecule with arbitrary precision, so with Ongström precision, without requiring any fluorescence emission, because in this case, the molecule doesn't emit. And so this is really totally contrary, opposite to, to the previous concept of localizing molecule, where the emphasis is placed on the fluorescence emission pattern. Here, the emphasis of localizing is placed on the excitation pattern. So we put the burden of requiring many photons for localization, not on the fluorescence emission pattern, but on the excitation pattern. And excitation pattern, photons are cheap because they come from the laser. And not only that, um, you can imagine in, um, as a first rough guess that if you do it like this, there will be no wavelengths dependent. So, so the localization precision, unlike in uh, normal localization as it's used in palm storm, um, will not depend on the wavelengths. Why? Because we're just matching two points. You know, there is the donut zero that is a point and there is a say fluorescent molecule uh, that is a point. If you just match two points, it doesn't really matter uh, with which wavelengths, so green or blue or yellow or red, this excitation pattern is actually made. Now, um, now in reality, there is no such thing as a demon, uh, but you can approach the situation sort of by, by replacing the demon with a controller. You have a controller here and there is a photon detector, of course, that, that, um, that fits uh, the number of detections into the controller. And now if um, the molecule, so to speak, starts moving, we would detect rest and molecule simply because the zero does not always coincide with the position of the molecule. But um, we know that the more detections will be seen here by the detector, the further away the molecule is from the position of the zero. And so we shift again using this controller, the zero of, of the uh, donut um, uh, excitation beam onto the molecule. So in other words, um, we, can, we can use, um, say, or we can measure actually the, the position of the molecule very effectively with very few emissions, simply because we only have to measure the distance, the residual distance between the position of the molecule from the position of the donut zero. Um, uh, and this means that we need much fewer photon emissions than, than is usually the case, um, because the large part of the of the of the localization is done by the photon from the donut and only the residual distance has to be measured with the fluorescence and now i'm explaining to you how we actually find that out with the controller the position of the molecule and this is actually not very very difficult i'm showing a very simple situation which actually explains actually the, the basic benefits of this concept let's assume the molecule is actually within this range here um, and so we don't know that it's here, so, but we have to find out. So what do we do? This is the donut for excitation. Of course, this is the profile of the donut, okay? This is the profile, it looks like this. And here we map the fluorescence emission. And now if the donut starts moving, 
you see once the zero um, of the donut coincides with um, with the molecule, I'm showing it again. So the donut starts moving, okay? And you see now the zero of the donut coincides with the, with the position of the molecule, then the fluorescence emission is zero. It's clear because um, if the zero coincides with the molecule, there's no fluorescence emission. And then we know where the molecule is located. It must be here in this position XM. And now you may say, okay, in order to find it out in this way, we have to scan very closely and densely the donut across the molecule. That's not the case, because if you know that the profile here of the donut is, um, say, has a certain function, and in the first approximation it will be a quadratic function, then it's perfectly enough to measure the fluorescence at the two endpoints. And this is why I'm, I'm showing these endpoints in purple and in orange here. So it's perfectly enough to measure the fluorescence here at the, to at the position of the donut when they are in the end po endpoints and zero and one because you can calculate with a simple simple say algebraic um, uh, solution of a quadratic equation you can simply simply calculate where the molecule actually is located so within this quadratic approximation where you assume that here at a, around the zero the, um, the intensity is a quadratic function which is which it always will you can calculate easily that um, the position XM of the molecule is given by the distance L where the molecule is assumed to be located. So it was assumed to be located within this distance divided by unity plus the ratio of, of, of uh, N, uh, the square root of the ratio of N1 uh, divided. Basically, this is the number of photons that are detected at the two endpoints. Again, you measure just, you, you measure here the first and measure here the first and then you can calculate where the molecule is. Now, it must be XM. But there's another interesting aspect that we can see actually from this equation. There is no wavelength dependence in here. This is very, very interesting. And, and then there is also no molecular orientation dependence. So um, in first approximation, uh, here we can locate the molecule without having to worry where, how the molecule is oriented in space, contrary to the normal localization, which is done in uh, Palm Storm. Now, the the precision with which we get a position of the molecule, and that's interesting, um, uh, scales now with L, with this range L. And this is very, very useful because we can do it in an iterative way, the finding of the position of the molecule. We can do it such that, that we first measure roughly where it is, then we have a course approximation. But then once we have the course approximation, we can reduce this distance L. We can say we can zoom in so to speak on the molecule and then the precision will go up and this is of course more effective reducing this l is more effective than waiting for more photons to come so in a normal localization as it done in palm storm you have to wait and wait and wait to get n larger but that's ineffective because it scales only with the square root so that takes a lot of time so you need 100 times more photons in order to get only a tenfold improvement in resolution but here if you decrease l say 100 times, you get 100 times improvement of, of, of precision. And so it's always more effective to reduce L than to wait for more photons. And so in other words, once um, you have a rough estimate in the first step where the molecule is, you decrease the region where you look for it, and then the precision goes up automatically. So um, a way of doing that is to do it iteratively, just to look coarsely where it is, and then, then bring the zero, so to speak, closer to the molecule. And this reflects the basic idea with the demon. You have to bring the zero close to the molecule, and the closer you bring, bring it, the smaller the, this residual gap is, the more precise you will be, the fewer photons you need. Now, uh, this was just a single dimensional case, a 1D case. In 2D, you would need uh, perhaps three points. It's better to use four points because it makes it more stable and more robust against, um, say, small, uh, uh, say, uh, deviations or so stemming from the fact that we are still um, recording uh, photons that are, um, uh, that are subject to Poissonian statistics, but it doesn't change much. Um, it doesn't really change much because, uh, again, we have a precision that scales with L, and now L is not um, just a line, L is a, a radius because we look in two dimensions, and it's always more effective to decrease L rather than to wait for more photons to be detected. So as a rule of thumb, in practice, you can save 20 to 100 times detections to get the same localization precision. So 20 to 100 times um, fewer detections are needed 
in order to get the same precision as you would get with a normal localization that is done in palm storm. And this is why now using MinFlux, we have been able to separate those molecules. Unlike in a standard palm storm case now, in the MinFlux case, we can separate the molecules very precisely and the precision that we get here is of the order of a nanometer, so the order of the size of the molecule itself. In order to separate, in order to separate that, we have to do an, an on-off transition, of course, of the molecules. Even six nanometer close molecules um, could be um, uh, could be separated, as you as you can see in here. Not in palm storm, but now in mean flux, you can get the separation. Don't forget, and this is actually quite striking now. When I started the field, I mean, I said, well, at some point it will be possible to get down to the uh, molecular scale. People really saw that I'm crazy. Uh, they said, oh, this guy is exaggerating. He will never get a job because he's making such um, ludicrous claims that are scientifically totally outrageous. Uh, but now it's true. Um, uh, if you can switch floor force on and off individually, you can now attain a molecule scale optical resolution of floor force, even with normal objective lenses. So it's not about changing the, the, the imaging modality. The key idea was to turn molecules on and off, of course, floor force on and off to, to, to make them separable. And of course, you, um, you have to find out where they are. Now, um, uh, fewer detections are needed now. This is why we, 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 um, um, we get with MinFlux. Um, it's very, very um, high um, uh, localization precisions, faster localization, and you have a negligible dependence on emission dipole orientation. This is why this method has become so su successful. <clears throat> now, for those of you who want to apply it to biological problems, the limits that are set now um, to the imaging are not set by the optics anymore or by the wavelengths or so. They are set by the labeling and the size of the labels. And this is not a physical problem. Um, it is a labeling problem. It's a problem of, say, labeling chemistry, or biochemistry, molecular biology, but not an optics problem. It's not a physics problem anymore. Can you take large fields of views? Um, um, yeah, of course, um, one way of doing it is you, you scan over large fields of views and localize the molecules individually. And this is just an early result that I'm showing you now where we looked at nuclear pores that were um, imaged on a, say, larger field of view. And again, uh, a conservative estimate of the spatial resolution the, um, is that once you can separate the molecules individually, you can have a spatial resolution um, that is below um, three nanometers. So the precision, of course, in that case, will determine the spatial resolution. And now um, if you look, if you zoom in on these nuclear pore complexes, um, it is uh, actually quite um, um, uh, revealing that you can get uh, say, uh, lo localization clusters here that can be associated with individual molecules. And uh, this shows that the molecule scale, uh, molecule scale resolution has been reached. Now, this is that uh, which won a share of the Nobel Prize. There's a factor of 10 in between the resolution of the two. And there's another factor of 10 from here to confocal. So between confocal, which used to be the gold standard um, in, in, in the year 2000, if you will, um, is, um, is now um, uh, worse by a factor of 100 over what you can do now. So, so MinFlux can do a spatial resolution that is 100 times better than confocal. Um, and I'm sure this will um, be a big difference. Um, and it's, of, co of course, already making differences. Now, it can be done in the life cycle conditions as well, if the molecules can be um, turned on and off. Uh, of course, if they move very quickly, then it's difficult to localize them and the pattern will, will change. In this case, it's better to con confine the field of view to, um, to small dimensions. Um, ways of getting the field of view up is to use many donuts or line patterns or something like that, which has advantages and disadvantages. And these are projects that will certainly be, be done, um, at least by somebody in the world. Um, at this point, I would like to acknowledge the people who have contributed to this development, um, and so either as PhD students or as postdocs. Um, and, and, and this particular gentleman, uh, Francisco Baltarotti, is now continuing his academic career. And here are the papers where everything is explained. But there's another point that I would like to uh, make here. Uh, when I started this field, so of 
breaking the diffraction barrier and, and getting to a very high spatial resolution, ideally down to a molecular scale. I was driven just by curiosity. I didn't want to do something for the life sciences or something. But curiosity can very often lead to breakthroughs. And the breakthroughs was that you can overcome the diffraction barrier using a state transition and an off transition. And if you have a breakthrough, this always leads to economic value. And this is why um, um, realizing the need, of course, for such high resolution instruments, I set up with my students um, a company. Um, and that's why I showed the disclaimer. And they have actually managed to, to uh, come up with a rugged version of this Minflux concept. So the reason why I'm showing you this is you shouldn't think this is just an academic game that can be done in an in a, in a academic lab. You can also uh, get a high, uh, high spatial resolution um, uh, under, say, normal lab settings. And you see here now the resolution in this commercial version is, is as good as it in, in, in my lab. So it's a sigma of 2.2. And there is even a Z resolution incorporated in this case. Now you see the, the, the nuclear pores in three dimensions and the spatial resolution in Z is of the order of, um, of uh, 1.6 nanometers. And this again shows um, the huge progress that can be made, of course, just by, by, by um, uh, say, um, uh, exploiting a very strong principle and then uh, doing uh, the technological developments that are needed. In this case, of course, um, uh, several points have been used, so um, uh, seven points in this case, uh, five here in X and Y, and uh, one above and below the focal plane. And the Z resolution, as I said, with a single lens, is of the order of, um, say, below two nanometers. Now, not only you can image, you can also track faster because you need fewer photons to localize the molecules. And say, um, this is a new tracking record, if you will, Precision of 13 nanometers of molecular movements um, could be attained in only 234 microseconds, and the molecules can be tracked here. Uh, this is a lipid, a labeled lipid on a, on a membrane with very high spatial temporal resolution. Now, um, I think MinFlux will benefit, of course, and its applications from this high precision that can be attained within a very short period of time. So it will be um, pre time for for looking into molecular movement. So this is a big, big uh, range of applications and also a high um, uh, optical resolution, as I have shown, will uh, be a, a major strong point of this method. So depending on the floor for and on the sample background, the, uh, the resolution will be of that order. So what about STED? So STED was the first concept that overcame the diffraction barrier. Uh, and some of you may think now that might be totally outdated now that there is a resolution that is that good. That's not the case. So I would even say that the good um, days of STAT are yet to come. Why? Um, as I explained in the beginning, instead you have an excitation beam, you have again this donut shaped beam that targets a coordinate in a sample plane. Okay, here's a zero. Then you have this region where fluorescence is allowed because the donut beam in this case doesn't excite the molecule, it turns them off. And so so the molecules here are not able to emit. So we have here a zero fluorescent zone. And now this can be used in order to mimic a situation like in MinFlux. We can take this region where the molecule is allowed to emit and, and make, make it rotate like this. Let's assume the molecule is again here. Um, and then, of course, this is the center of rotation. And now if you manage to, so again, to, to coin, make the center of rotation where there is no fluorescence, um, emission uh, or excitation coincide with the position of the molecule again, then we can localize using this combination of excitation and stat beam, the molecule very, very precisely, like a mint flux. So in a way, the circulation, of course, emulates um, the donut shaped beam that we had in the mint flux case. Now, you may say, now, why is this good? Why not just doing mint flux and why doing what we call now mint stat? That the thing is, the stat beam has an advantage over min flux. It keeps the background low. And say a conceptual limit, so to speak, of the min flux concept is that the background, of course, will not allow the precise um, measurement of the position of the molecule if the background is too high. And here, min stat has an advantage. And as you can see here, say 100 photons were perfectly enough, or 200 photons were perfectly enough to localize with a sigma of 2 nanometers. So, so this is even. The funny thing is even more effective in a way than MinFlux in practice 
And this has led to very, very sharp images. Um, so MinSTAT images, as you can see here now, again, Confoco as a reference, that uh, then as a reference. And now the MinSTAT images, if you look at them here um, again, um, you get a sigma of 2.1 in this sample in the cell with uh, 1,200 counts. This is not much and, and molecular scale resolution. Now, the good thing is now that with that, you can tune now from the diffraction limit essentially down to the molecular scale. And this shows that that uh, means that like mean flux is definitely um, one of the um, very, very powerful methods in the future. So what are the applications in the future? Making molecular maps in cells, say of the nucleus of ER, Golgi, and so on in 3D uh, with the highest possible spatial resolution. And then of course, also looking into molecular dynamics. So watching molecules move very quickly at small scales with the highest possible precision. To my, in my view, there's no other method. I can imagine right now another method that could detect molecular movements at this spatial temporal resolution as it is the case with mean flux or, or mean step. And with that, I'm thanking you very much for listening so patiently. Thank you. Wow, uh, Professor Stamehio, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, it's amazing to see that the resolution of a fluorescence microscope goes from 200 nanometer then to 20 nanometer and now it's only two nanometer so maybe i'll start with the first question so sure. do you think is the art limit limit for the resolution yes i mean optically um as i said there is um in, in optical terms there's no limit anymore so there is no fundamental physical limit that can uh, that put a say a uh, a, 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 a very strict boundary to what you can uh, resolve. However, there are practical limits in fluorescence microscopy, which uh, stem from the fact that the flow force, of course, are only used uh, as a proxy for the molecules that you usually want to see. For example, you want to see a certain protein, of course, um, in fluorescence microscopy, you don't see the protein directly. You see only the flow force that stands as a proxy that labels uh, the protein of interest. And so you have to keep into um, uh, you have to take into account that the fluorophore has its own size, and of course, um, there is a distance between the fluorophore and the protein of interest or the molecule of interest. So the distance uh, given by a linker or maybe a nanobody or something. So the actual limits right now are not optically; uh, they are just given by by uh, the labeling procedure that is inherent to um, to fluorescent imaging. So, so in optical terms, um, limits ha have all been um, sorted out. But of course, in the, in labeling terms, there are there are practical limits for those who want to use the microscopes. Okay, thank you. So I'll take the questions from the audience. There are a lot of questions coming now. So maybe the first question: uh, At what point is a floral for itself going to be too big? For the donut use the mean flux, or is that not a problem at all? For example, the difference between looking at the GFP versus a uh, nothing mind fluorophore. Yeah, I mean, um, typically the um, the fluorophore, say the say the fluorescing part, so to speak, of the molecule in question, is of the order of um of uh, one to two nanometers. So that's uh, the pi conjugated, say, uh, electron uh, system, um, and that of course probably will not be, um, um, you cannot make that smaller anymore, at least not for polyatomic molecules. And so, um, so, so that, that is clearly, a, say, a fundamental limit. And um, um, of course, if you have molecules that are very close, say two fluorescent molecules, um, they will kind of interact uh, with each other. They will exchange energy, there will, will be collective behavior. So um, at distances that are below five nanometers or so, there will be um, effects going on that um, uh, that are very specific to the flow force. Okay. But um, the, the donut itself, I mean, um, will not be a problem in that sense. Uh, what what limits, so to speak, the use of a donut or of any um, intensity minimum is the fact that there is background. So um, there's always some background that kind of makes a zero not a perfect zero. Um, um, so there will always be some some DC level of, of of light intensity that will not make it perfectly round. But we are but but the good news here in, in actually in this research is that we can attain the maximum spatial resolution. Um, so that is 
at the size of the molecule without requiring a perfect donut or something. So it works even in practice. So this is this is actually the good news. And if you will, the surprising news that you can really get down to the molecular scale despite all the practical lim limitations of making donuts and, and the rest of it. Okay, so here is another very interesting question. Uh, thank you for the intriguing talk, Professor Hale. Do quantum effects play a role in the loc location of the molecule in your experiment? Or are those a much smaller order of magnitude? Yes, if you think about quantum effects, like, uh, okay, you, know, you apply the De, Bro the De Broglie um, wavelengths to the molecule, so that, that is much smaller. That is very, very much smaller. And of course, the molecule is attached to the environment, uh, like coherent effects with the environment or so, um, that that won't play a role. Um, so I don't think that that plays a role. But of course, don't forget, quantum effects per se are used here uh, in order to make this type of microscopy viable because in the end what we do is we we um, we place molecules in two different states like an emissive state and non-emissive state in order to make them separable so without quantum mechanics this whole thing wouldn't work so at the time that the uh, diffraction uh, uh, limit was discovered there was no quantum mechanics i mean and i'll be back in 1873 didn't know about molecular states and of course not about quantum mechanics um, and that's why he would have never come up with uh, with a solution as we have come up. But now that we use, say, say the, the consequences of quantum mechanics, namely there are states in the molecule and, and transitions due to photons and so on, because of that, we can overcome the diffraction barrier. So there is a lot of quantum in what, I, what I've been showing. But of course, the quantum effects that you are alluding to most likely um, do not play a role. I see. Okay, so we here we come with a question with a sample preparation. So what are the limitations of mean flux? I'm wondering how to ensure perfect sample stability versus a minor sample drift without compromise the precision of the molecular detection? Yeah, this is a very good um, uh, question that come up in practice. Yes, um, in order to make the, the experiment viable, you have to make sure that you compensate for drift. And, um, and actually in all these systems, including the one that I've shown you that is uh, commercially available, I, I would say the majority of the efforts actually went into making sure that um, that there is no drift or if there is drift, it's detected and then compensated. So usually you cannot avoid drift. Uh, there will always be some drift, but you have to make sure that you detect it with very high precision and then compensate for the drift. Um, so, that, so that definitely plays a role. But if you ask me about the limits, um, the limits are largely given by background, as I said, because uh, you are detecting individual molecules in a in a in a dark region where you don't excite them, and of course there will always be some background. And if you keep manage to keep the background low, and then then of course you can do it quicker um, and more precisely for a given number of detected photons. So this is also why um, it's very advantageous to have a say a confocal pinholes, so a, a spatial field in front of a detector, because that keeps background low. And this is why I believe that MinFlux um, has many more applications um, in 3D imaging, where you have to go deeper into a sample, because you have this ability to keep the background much lower than in other, say, single molecule detecting methods. Okay, thanks, Prof. So here is a question, like a Professor uh, Hale, are you able to do live cell imaging experiment with mean flux, mean stat, or will you be able to do it in the future? Mm -hmm. uh, very good question. Live cell imaging, it has actually been done. So um, so in one of the, the papers we've published actually in Nature Methods, there, there is an example where um, uh, say um, live cell images have been taken actually from nuclear pores um, with um, labeled with um, a version of a fluorescent protein. Yes, um, um, as I said, the limit is that something is moving very, very quickly, and then, and then of course, you don't have the time uh, to detect it. But again, MinFlux has here an advantage over most other methods, simply because you require fewer fluorescent photons to find out where the molecule is. So can you do live cell? Yes, sure, you can do it, and you can do it better than, say, with Palm Storm when it comes, when it comes to imaging small regions. But keep in mind, of course, if it will be moving too quickly, of course, then it's not possible um, to, to localize the molecule with the precision that you may want. But that's not a problem of min flux or so. That's, that's something that 
that always exists. If something moves, of course, then you need fewer, um, then you then you have to detect something more, uh, quicker. That's very clear because there's little time. I see. Okay, here comes another interesting question. Thanks for the fantastic talk, Prof. Hale. Do you think there's a potential for the combination of mean flux beam stat with the electron microscope to create high resolution correlative molecular maps? Absolutely, yes. Um, so that's not my cup of tea because I'm interested in, in, um, in exploring the physical limits, so to speak, of, uh, of imaging um, uh, uh, in fluorescence microscopy. But um, as a say technological say feat, uh, you can imagine to um, to combine uh, min flux or min stat with electron microscopy. I think it's it's a very powerful combination to be honest. So um, for for um, so a cutting edge research lab in cell biology, I would consider that. Or for a cutting edge research institution, I would I would do that. Yes, why? Because with electron microscopy, of course, you get um, uh, you get um, say morphology to some extent, of course, with very high spatial resolution nowadays, but you don't get specificity. So it's very hard to say, okay, this particular protein um, that I'm seeing now, because um, you don't have this specificity contrast that fluorescence microscopy can offer. And then uh, by combining, say, electron microscopy, cryo electron microscopy, for example, 3D cryo electron microscopy with, um, with min flux or min stat. You have a very, very, very powerful uh, combination. Very powerful combination. I'm sure this will come. Um, as I said, this is not so much my cup of tea because that's more. This is more or less a technology thing, and um, uh, um, uh, interesting for a user, not for me. I'm not a user, um, but uh, I think yes, that's definitely the future, and that's very powerful. Okay, so here is come with another relevant question. Thank you for the very impressive talk. I think the major disadvantage of uh, fluorescence microscope is uh, photo bleaching. Uh, is it possible to extend this method to other spectroscope techniques? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, definitely photo bleaching is an issue in fluorescence microscopy. There's no doubt about it. But um, I would like to say and, 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 and emphasize in this context that because min flux and also means that requires May require much fewer fluorescent photons. Bleaching is not so much of a problem than for the other techniques. So th this is something where, where, where which, which I think is totally underestimated at this point. Um, so we are going to develop dyes that emit only a few um, photons, say 100 photons, 200 photons, and then in the end still allow you to localize the molecule with very high precision, with a nanometer precision, because the concept of min flux or min stat requires only few fluorescence emissions uh, or much fewer fluorescence emissions than say palm storm or, or other methods. And I think this is, this is something that has not, um, not been developed um, uh, uh, to the end. So th there is a lot of potential in, in, in uh, finding out which fluorophores or which dye are, are, are Bleaching after a while, yeah, but it, that's okay because it, uh, the number of photons are not needed. So that's one point. The second point is, can I extend this to something that is not uh, fluorescence? Um, when it comes to tracking, for sure, that I'm absolutely convinced about because the, the, the principle of min flux localization is not limited to fluorescence. That's clear. You can you could imagine doing something like like a min flux tracking or localization with something that is scattering. So if that is your question, yes. Um, the main advantage of fluorescence imaging, if you ask me, apart from the specificity and so on, is the fact that you can easily play on and off. Okay, you very easily play on and off. So if something is fluorescing or something is not fluorescing. And since this is the key for the whole super resolution field by separating by on and off in order to make um, molecules or features distinguishable within the, within the nanometer zone, uh, that is not so easy to do with something um, else, like with another contrast modality, like uh, scattering Raman or, or coherent anti-Stokes Raman scattering or something like that. It's, it's not so easy, or reflection for that matter, it's not so easy to modulate those contrast modalities uh, um, in an on-off mode. Uh, and this is <clears throat> one of the reasons why fluorescence um, has been uh, so 
so working so nicely with super resolution because you can easily turn it on and off. Okay, thank you, Prof. We still have a lot of questions coming in now. I myself have also many questions, but unfortunately the time is up. So let's thank Prof. Stephen Hale again for the wonderful talk. Okay, and thank for the remarkable work done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Xiao. Yeah.